Father, we thank you for your mercies. We've come together to thank you for your goodness. We're so grateful for who you are to us. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days, I've been held in your hand. Good morning, good morning, good morning. The moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Good morning. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Y'all come on in. Good morning. Good morning. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Good morning, good morning, good morning, y'all. Come on in. Tony, good morning. Juan, good morning. Marie, good morning. Mom, good morning. Marque, good morning. Gail, Larry, Colleen, Spencer, Anna, Camille, Honeybee, Jesse, Susanna, Brittany, Jerry. Good morning, good morning. Tori, good morning. Bridget, good morning. Come on, can you stand here? I can't hear. I don't know why this is. Good morning, good morning. If you can't hear, you can go back out and then come back in. Or jump to our Instagram account. Good morning, Gina. Good morning, good morning. Hey, Shanae. Jamie, Kobe, Brother Ross, Kiana. Oh. IG should be better now. Candice Lacey, good morning. Timbo, good morning. Denise, good morning. Chase the Barber. Facebook, somebody was saying you got to turn the volume on. Natalie, good morning. Nisi, good morning. Benita, good morning. Seta, Lane, good morning. What up, sis? It's good now. Good, good. <laughs> Kiana. Carmen, good morning. Sandy, good morning. Sally. Dana Dane, what's up, girl? Charity. Good morning. Good morning, cuz, Carla. Adrian, good morning, bro. Hope you're doing good up north. Julie. Good morning, Aaron. Brother Daniel, what's up? Y'all come on in and share. Share, invite some, invite some folks to join us. Kyla, good morning. Chastity, good morning. Noemi, good morning. Hello, Mount Herman. Good to see y'all. Good morning, Aaron. Dada, good morning. Thank you so much for that gracious note. I appreciate it, Dada. Oh, I will sing of 
Betsy, good morning. All right, let's go red, y'all. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come into this place. Let's invite the power of God. Tristan, let's go red in our timelines. Darius, good morning, bro. Let's invite the red carpet. Let's put the red carpet out. Let's say, Lord, we invite you in. There you go. There you go. Come on. Father, we invite you into this place. We need you right now. God, would you meet us in this place? Marissa, good morning. Darren, Father, would you come into this place? Sylvia, good morning. Kara, good morning. Crash, good morning. Father, we invite you in this place. Father, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We invite you into this place. We got broken hearts. We got heavy burdens. We got weary souls. So, Father, we just invite you to sit. Sit a while with us, Father. Uh, as we come and gather this morning, would you sit with us? Would you meet us in this space? Would you have your way? Would you move by your spirit? In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. What a, um, what a week, what a weekend, what a year. God is faithful. We're desperate today. We're desperate today. We're desperate today. Uh, we're thankful for your presence. God, we're thankful for your presence. Good morning, y'all. Um, I'm so thankful that you're here. I, we, we're going to do something a little different today. Um, I, I just feel like if you're anything like me, I just kind of need a space. I just need some space. Um, so I want to invite you by way of devotional. It is different. I, the, the Lord gave me something early this morning. Um, as we gather together, I want you to, if you're in a space where you can just get comfortable, get comfortable. Um, and I want to, I want to spend a little time in, um, in kind of like social media silence. So throughout our time together today, I want to invite you after I'm going to I'm going to play a song and we're going to have a time of prayer. So you can you can talk now. But after that, I'm going to invite you to um, I'm gonna invite us not to talk on here for a little while um, and only just use emojis. So if you want to express something, if you want to engage, um, only use emojis, um, but just no words. Um, I love that uh, Alexander, uh, breaking news, the sun rose again today. The sun did rise today. The sun rose today um, and, um, and God has been faithful, but there's so much noise in my head. There's so much noise and everything is so hot. Uh, I feel like the block is so high. Everything is so high. The, the emotions are high. The, the passions are high. The anger, the frustrations are at a simmering height. Um, and I want us to just pause and invite the Lord to take our hand. Um, and the Lord gave me this vision at like two o'clock this morning. I got up at like two o'clock this morning. And I want us to sit for a moment. Leon Timbo is in here. He's going he's gonna to sing over us and invite us to take the Lord's hand. And then I want us to sit and on the, on the panels, on the things, no words at all. I don't want us to talk at all. I just want us to use emojis. And if people, new people come in, um, just use emojis. Um, just use emojis. And as new people come in, one, somebody can remind them, but we don't need to go off on and be like, no, we're not using words today. But just a little, just a little thing. I wish I knew how to pin stuff. I can't pin it. I don't, that'll take me 20 minutes of my time. But I want us to practice just no words. Just no words. Some of us have been talking. We've been seeing words. We've been reading words. It's just been overwhelming. 
So I want you to just go no words. So even now, let's go ahead and go. So just no words. I want us to sit. And this is interesting. I've never done this before, but this is what the Lord gave me. He gave me, I want, I want to tell you, I want to give you a message from the future. So after we sit with the song together, I'm going to give you a message from the future where we talk about what happened the year in 2020. So I'm going to bring you a message from the future concerning 2020. But right now, would you just allow your heart and soul to pray this prayer and, that, and invite the Lord God to take your hand? Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on. is my home God, me so I've been invited to do this interview about the year 2020. Um, here I sit many years later, but I can tell you that year was unexpected. It was the year that everybody was excited about because it was the year of a new decade. So if you go back in the history books, everyone was all excited about this new decade and starting the 2020 decade. Um, but it ended up being the year that no one anticipated. I'm telling you, one of the first things that happened in the year 2020 that folks didn't anticipate was the coronavirus, a pandemic. This, this generation had never seen it before. So this generation, um, many of us knew 9-11 years before that, but other than that, other than hurricanes and different things, it, nothing had ever broken, hit American soil like this before. So the coronavirus, I mean, for those of you that weren't around then, or you, 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 you read about it in the history books, but the year 2020, um, in a matter of 48 hours, people had to pack up everything that they had and go to their homes and they were quarantined for days and days and days with a lot of miscommunication. There are people talking in 2020 saying that it wasn't real, that it wasn't a pandemic, it was a pandemic. So uh, there were racial disparities, uh, even with that where Black and brown people were experiencing higher death rates than other folks. It was it was un, unlike anything we'd ever seen before. So it was already probably one of the worst years many had seen, and, and it was very frustrating. But also in the year of 2020, as you know, that's why you even asked me to talk about this, is 
It was a year where Ahmad Arbery was gunned down. We watched it on video. Breonna Taylor, there's no footage, but she was killed in her home. And then, I'll never forget the day that I saw it when it dropped up George Floyd. So in the year 2020, you had coronavirus happening, people in quarantine, there's a hostility already brewing that has, that has some racial tones, but they're not sharp. But then when Ahmad Brianna, George, the tenor of 2020 in, the, in the, the rage of racism went to a feverish pitch. It, 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 it got to a level to where uh, people say, forget the quarantine, and they hit the streets. So with coronavirus rampant in weeks before we were scared to go out of the house, now the anger and the rage is so to the point to where we're like, forget the virus. There's a greater virus infecting us. People were outraged. I remember, I remember, I remember being there during that time, living in multi-ethnic spaces, but being so angry, I spoke with a, with a clarity and an authority that I had never really spoken before. Because at that point, and I, and I remember talking to other black leaders, it, it, you really cared a lot less about what other people thought. And you really cared a lot less about trying to make sure people understood and heard. You were so angry, you just had to get it out. So you were just saying it. And you would go online and just see people just denouncing. And to be honest, there was a lot of frustration because a lot of people were on all of the, you know, all the social media platforms back then were Facebook and Instagram and, and Twitter. And people were just saying, yo, basically I'm mad as hell and I can't take this anymore. And they were, they were calling out their friends. Many of us, we called out the silence of our friends and said, if you're going to be silent now, that really defines our friendship. It was, I don't ever remember, because, because the videos were so clear, it was so unapologetic. And then you had the Karen in Central Park thing, which was a whole other thing back then. You, you have to go and look that up. But it was, it was so blatant and so in your face, there was just an outrage unlike I'd ever seen before. And the silence of whites was deafening. It was, um, so it was a confrontation where you had this black, these, these lynchings, these murders, these executions, and then you had what, what felt like just this deafening silence, and then the protest. <sighs> the protest. It's like there are two worlds that were happening. The history books, you gotta read them carefully because I, I was there, I remember. You had peaceful protest, and then we had footage. One of the first times, I think, in our generation, footage of agitators that would actually come in to peaceful protest, and as the sun would go down, they would begin to agitate, to transition protests, to riots, and to looting. And there's footage, you can go back on Google and check, there's footage of this being outsiders, many whites um, who, were, who were trying to raise the temperature of the, of the peace rallies. You've got black girls on camera screaming at white people that are doing vandalism, saying, stop that, that's not us, that's not us. One of the leading organizations in that time was Black Lives Matter. And they're saying, that's not us, we're doing peaceful protests, that's y'all, who are you? One mayor got on and said, everyone that was arrested the night before didn't even live in the city. These are people that came in, agitators. And that's when, that's when it began to happen. I think that's when they begin to realize, wait a minute. There are forces and there's a strategy that's set up to provoke peace and turn it into violence. 
I'm not sure if we ever knew that like we like we discovered it then. We we had receipts, we had evidence, we saw people. It was one undercover police officer that was bursting windows in auto zone. This these weren't black people out there being thugs and raging. These these were outside agitators that came to make blacks look bad. It was there were conspiracies and strategies set up. Now, there were people out there and busting windows and every, every it, it's all, but it was unreal to see how much of a strategy it was set up against us. And we were all split on it. You had Christians, you had people arguing about, is it right to loot? Is it right to riot? Don't they have a right? Aren't they angry enough? Hasn't it been bad? Maybe this is the cost of justice. People were all over the place, but the reality was something was happening to us and we were reacting to it. And, and it was almost about to become the regular old story. It almost did. It almost did in 2020. It almost became the regular old story of something bad happens. We protest. We protest. We riot. We have some prayer gatherings. Uh, we all gather together. We uh, Some white people and black people hug and hold hands on a picture. And then that's it. And the system perpetuates. <laughs> but that's not what happened in 2020. It looked like that was going to be it for a while, but something else different happened. Um, you know those um, those silent whites? I remember getting on the phone with black leaders and other leaders that are minorities and us getting on the phone and saying, hey, are you noticing something different this time? And, and it's a true story. I remember having the phone calls. Um, and, and it really, because most of the time on Facebook and Instagram and on these posts, all the social media spaces, this is where you were the most discouraged as a black person. Because you would see people that your coworkers, your church members, you would see people and you would see them post things like all lives matter or let's look at the facts or let's not rush to judgment. And, and logically, those things make sense, but it exposed how they saw this as like this one isolated incident. And for black folks, this was one long, exhausting movie that just released another scene. This wasn't some isolated incident. This was a longer narrative. So no, we don't, we don't, we and, and then the denial, when you say all lives matter, we, we just got used to that. That was their way of saying, yeah, no. Nah. We, we were so frustrated at them because we had had Colin Kaepernick kneeling and in, in, in many whites had lost, I mean, they lost it because of the lack of patriotism. So we were charged as not being patriots, as being discred being disrespectful to the country. And, and no, no one would give words to the abusive domestic violence the blacks had experienced ever since while fighting for that flag to, to be lifted. We're some of the greatest patriots in the history of this country. Number one, we built it, and then we fought for the right to go and defend it when other people tried to stop, tried to come against us. We fought for it and built it, and, and it was slavery, no compensation, and all that. So they, Colin Kaepernick lost his football career. The president of the United States called him sons of bitches and everyone else that did it. It was so... To be honest, by the time 2020 came, we had a we had a low expectation for for any type of honestly for any type of love from our white Christian siblings. The expectation was really low. But I'll never forget in 2020, I started getting calls from my other black leaders and friends, and they said, Are you seeing this? Is this happening with you too? Whites are speaking out. Yeah, man, did you see did you see such and such post? Did you see his post? Did you see her post? And we looked and on our timelines, white friends who would normally disappoint us in this moment were speaking strong. I mean bold. They were saying things that I never thought that they would say. And then protests came and I was getting pictures from white friends, white siblings that have historically been silent. And they were speaking up. They were showing up in ways that we, I, we had never seen. So we were low key. Honestly, we were suspicious.
But we were like, yo, I've never seen them show up like this. I've never heard white people defend like this. I've never heard, you see the rally, they're standing against us. I've never got, I remember personally, y'all, I remember personally, the year 2020, I got literally hundreds of comments, direct messages, personal messages of white people repenting for what they had refused to see, for what they had refused to acknowledge before. And I never seen it before. That's when I knew, that's when I began to think this may be something different because whites weren't talking. Now, yeah, I got a couple of emails. I got one. Uh, I, I never forget this lady years ago. She worked, I, I don't know. I, well, I don't, I, I, she still may be alive. I don't even want to tell her who she is. But she said, this is not about race and uh, how dare you uh, make this about races and, and, and white people need to know all the facts. It's, it's weak in the wrong with knowing all of it. So you still had that around. But yo, that was the makings of when we first saw what would become the disciples of 2020. Um, they, would, they would infamously be known as the remnant, the disciples of 2020. These, these were those who said, yeah, I'm tired of being silent. And they begin to speak. They begin to show up. And it brings tears to my eyes even now, years and years later. Because that's when I realized personally as a black man that I'm not alone. You see me. You are a true sibling. And we are one body in Christ. And you see that when the black bodies in the body are hurting, that you hurt as well. I saved those letters. I saved those messages. People repenting of ignoring our plights from years past. People repenting of them hearing the message but not listening to the message. That's when many of us thought we were onto something. We were cynical, though. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. We were cynical. We were like, yeah, y'all showing up now, but how? Uh, we ain't never been here before. But you know what? We're siblings. We're family. So, so you got to trust. You got to keep walking. So what do we do? That's when we realized, too, uh, in 2020, you had to stop. At first, we were just reacting to it. I know I was. We were all, many of us, we were just outraged, angry. And anger was there, but but hatred was hovering right above it. Like, we were almost evolving into anger and hatred. And that's when many of us just stopped and said, you know what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is this not spiritual warfare at its best? Is this, if there's anything, is there, if there's any such thing as a demonic attack, is this not it? Like, is this not it? You got coronavirus, you got death, you got, you got, it's, it's almost like a book of Exodus. You got plagues, you got us quarantined, you got, you got people passing away, you got disease, you got fear just hovering in the air. And in the midst of that, then you drop racism, you drop this, out. wait a minute, we are under attack. We're under attack. Wait a minute. And, and the enemy comes in this moment. What does the enemy want to do? How does he win? He divides us. He divides us so he can destroy us. And we're in a political system that's more divisive now than ever. We're in a culture to where even coronavirus got divisive according to ethnicity or party or church or who's opening up the church. And then you got three Back to back to back instances that's fully captured to fully recorded captions, uh, even Karen in Central Park. That's three videos literally days after one another. Wait a minute. Somebody's doing something to us. This is that. So we started punching each other. We started swinging at each other. We start calling each other out. If you don't say nothing, we done. And I'm, well, I'm down with riding. I'm not down with riding. We tearing stuff up. And at some point in 2020, we had to stop and say, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But this is spiritual wickedness in high places. And we can't set a fire big enough to tear down spiritual weakness. So there's a moment where we realize. i never forget 
one of the great generals of faith, uh, Dr. Tony Evans, he did a video and he talked about how systemic injustice in this system, we had the wrong goal. We had the wrong goal. We thought, because we were young then, we were young and naive. And, and a lot of times, honestly, we didn't listen to our elders. The, there are folks that have been here before. There were folks that walked in the 60s that knew strategy, knew or, how to organize, knew big picture. We didn't listen to them. We just packed up and started hitting the street and making posts on, on, on social media. We weren't sitting down trying to strategize. So we were young and naive, thinking that if we, if we raid some targets and if we burn some stuff up or if we peacefully protest and just run out there, if we just make a statement on social media, then change is going to happen. We didn't realize the bigger picture. You're not going to get rid of systemic injustice. The system ain't going ain't gonna to go away. There's a system, and it's, de it's designed to defeat you. You're not going to win by destroying that system. That system ain't going to be destroyed over a couple of marches and a couple of speeches and some Facebook posts and a petition. It is, it is, but we, not, we believe that. We believe that. But I'll never forget, he said, <laughs> he said, it's like football. You got the Dallas Cowboys, and you got Dak Prescott, quarterback playing offense. I don't care. You're going to offense will always have a defense. The defense will always be there. So us trying to get rid of systemic injustice or the system is like us trying to get rid of the defense. It ain't going nowhere. It ain't going nowhere. Well, I know, I know what you're thinking. I thought the same thing. That's the most discouraging thing I've ever heard in my life. Well, what are we doing then? Well, you don't overcome defense by getting rid of them. You overcome defense by being better than them. So we got to be better than them. And we realize we got to be better than the defense. We got to learn how to beat the system. The system ain't going to go nowhere, but we can be better than the system. We can be smarter than the system. And we ain't going to beat nothing. You're not going to ever be better if we don't come together. So the disciples of 2020, who will become ultimately known as the remnant, the story is long. I don't have time to tell you everything that they did, but can I tell you a few things that they did that were just absolutely phenomenal? The year 2020, these disciples, they got together. Let me tell you something. <laughs> it's a sight to see. It was a sight to see. Three big things they had to overcome to get better in 2020. And you watched them do it. Number one, they had to overcome division. They had to overcome division. They had to look at each other in the eyes, the siblings, kingdom siblings, and had to say, we really want the same thing. But the rea reality is, in order for us to get the same thing, it doesn't cost the same price. So some of us had more access than other. And although we want the same thing, we can't say we want the same thing and not recognize that it doesn't, it doesn't cost us all the same thing. It doesn't cost us all the same thing. I want to be able to run down the street and not get uh, harassed by a police officer and not get killed. That cost me, a, that's going to cost a whole lot for me to get to that place. Whereas my white brothers and sisters, that's natural. That's not even a thought. So we had to look at one another and say, we want the same thing, but it's going to cost something different and it's going to call all of us to be disrupted. So we were fighting one another. We were punching one another and, and what we needed was to come together. But in order for us to come together, it required what would become known as the silent whites. <laughs> I know you, you the, the, the term became woke whites. <laughs> Back then, there was a whole lot of language about being woke. And what I'm telling you, this movement, what, what was necessary is we had, to, we had to transition and stop giving so much attention to the silent whites. And we had to turn the volume up to the woke whites. And woke whites showed up. Woke whites showed up. And this is how they showed up. There was a whole season of just intentional training and learning where they watch movies like 13th uh, or read books like White Fragility or read books like Woke Church. And that way, when they had conversations with other African-Americans or other minorities, they, they, they had a sense of the landscape because there was a teacher fatigue to where minorities, you could just feel overwhelmed. Is this my job now is to teach you 
how to be a better non-racist. That's just, it's, it's overwhelming. So go do research, go do your homework and bring me some perspectives and we begin to process. And I'm telling you, I just remember Zoom calls. I remember uh, coffees. I remember times where we were having deep conversations. Whereas it wasn't me trying to help them understand racism or why I was so mad. It was them saying, I never saw it before. If I had a dollar for every time I sat with someone who said they never saw it before back in 2020, I'd be rich because they just didn't see it. You know what? We also discovered that one of the strategies of systemic injustice is we didn't realize there are whole systems designed to help whites not to see it. We discovered historically, you can go back and research this. There were very highly paid black conservatives where their job was to tell whites race was not an issue. It does not matter. Well, I tell you, there were some conservative blacks that made millions of dollars because their job was to convince whites and to make whites feel better and to make the rest of the blacks feel like they were irrelevant or they were, that was a word, the term they used back then to just dismiss the whole argument. They created a whole term. It's called race baiting. You're just race baiting. You're just making it about race. You're just making, so they disqualified any attempt for righteous redemption when it comes to race because the black conservatives that were highly paid, it was their job to convince whites that race didn't exist. So as we got into the conversation with our white siblings who were waking up to some of these realities, history doesn't lie, stats doesn't lie, but turned out Fox News lied, MSNBC lied, CNN lied because they would all speak to the echo chamber of their hearers. So we would just sit in these echo chambers where all of our ideas were just reinforced. So we never sat in diverse spaces to hear different perspectives centered on God's word so that we might hear the truth. Now, this was a big thing back in 2020. This is how the enemy almost took us out. We just had, we had Fox News Christians. We had CNN Christians. We had MSNBC Christians. We had BBC Christians. But everybody, but everybody sat in their own echo chamber. And if all you hear is people that agree with you, that live like you, that vote like you, you will never experience the fullness of the kingdom of God. And we had to learn that. So we had to wake up. We had to learn from one another. We had to learn from one another. At, with my anger... My, it had to become righteous and not hateful. So as a black man, I had to be a righteously angered black man where I had righteous anger, but I had to war. I had to war against hatred because you can't build a kingdom with people that you hate. So you'll go back. Some of those conversations was unveiling ignorance of things that we cho had chosen not to see, but it was also surrendering hate and extending forgiveness and redemption and taking that cynicism and holding on to a godly optimism that we call hope so that we might move to another level. Back in 2020, if we would, if we never, if, this was so pivotal. If we didn't do this, we never would have made it because we never would have trusted each other to go any further in the movement. We never would have made any progress. Because let me tell you something. The way we beat the defense, systemic injustice, the way we become better than them is we need one another. We need woke whites. We need righteously angered blacks. And you know what else? Let me tell you something. I didn't even see this one coming. I didn't see this one coming, but it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. You had Asians saying we ain't gonna sit silently over here and not participate because it's usually pretty much a black and white ball game and in 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 brown folks and asian folks latino folks usually are forced to sit on the sideline and we let them into the conference but they said no we ain't we ain't gonna be out we are in so at the rallies at the prayer meetings yo you had blacks, you had whites, you had Asians, you had Latinos, you had uh, Indians uh, from India. You had every sphere, every hue. It was unbelievable. They all showed up because they realized this ain't just a black problem. This is a humanity problem. And we all got to stand and give guard for one another. 2020 was amazing. You saw folks coming together that you never thought would participate. You want to know the craziest thing? Seeing passionate Asians go off about black power and black lives. I, y'all, it was beautiful. 
My Latino brothers showing up, my Latino sisters showing up, saying, not on our watch. We up in here together and we all going to get free together. It really spread. It really helped. A lot of blacks really said, we've got to get more engaged in, in y'all's issues because y'all are so invested in ours. It, we, it, became a, it became a real fight for us all and it became less isolated, it became less isolated. So we overcame division. Um, we began to educate one another. And let me tell you something. It takes a lot to do that. I say that quickly, but it takes, it takes a lot of humility. It takes courage. The woke whites had to be courageous. The angry blacks had to trust God so that we might trust them. So that we might love and forgive and not hate. It was supernatural. One of the reasons why, as you look at movements that's disrupted racism the way that it has, Christians are the, are the main group, churches are the main ones that have done that. Because it takes a supernatural love to pull this thing off. Not to want to burn something down, but to want to try to build something up while somebody's got their knee in your neck. It takes a special kind of grace and love. And I'm going to tell you something. One of the most, they, it, this title didn't stick, but some, some com commenters referred to it as Bloody Sunday. It was right in the heat of everything that was happening. And it was on a Sunday. And the Sunday happened to be Pentecost. And it was on Pentecost Sunday where there were a lot of riots, a lot of stuff. I think, it, I think the enemy messed up when he put it on Pentecost. Because believers started thinking about what happened on Pentecost. And while there are fires on the ground on Pentecost, there were fires that came from heaven. And I think it was something about being fed up and frustrated. We said, we won't settle for the fire on the ground. We want the fire from heaven. So we started reaching for something bigger, something greater. I wish I could tell you all that happened in 2020. There are just a couple other things that I'll tell you, then, then we'll move on. Um, as we begin to overcome division, we had to begin to demand change because the goal wasn't for us just to come together to love one another. The goal was for us to love one another through changing the landscape. So we demanded change. We demanded change. Now, here it is. Uh, it's, not, it's not about what we demanded, but it's about how we demanded it. And this was so important because this was a threat. This was being threatened in 2020. Um, we had to do it with love and through prayer and trusting God. And now let me tell you, these words were almost curse words in 2020 because people thought that that was an excuse for Christians to be passive. There was this whole thing where they thought our love, um, that, that, that be, being loving was a passive uh, posture and prayer was passive and trusting God was inactive. They thought prayer was passive and trusting God was inactive. And so they, we wouldn't get, we Christians almost had a bad reputation. It's like, get this love out of here. We need to do that. So it was like this rage where they thought that our love wouldn't have teeth, wouldn't bring about change. But what they would soon discover is that without love, if you pursue hate, it's so dark. It consumes you. I remember, I remember being angry and I remember the hate creeping and knocking at my door. I couldn't even get out of bed. I was sick to my stomach. The hate enrages you. I, I thought about Dr. John Perkins, who in a Brandon jail, he had been beat to death and he saw the hate in those white police officers' eyes. This is why we got to talk to our elders. This is why the, the thing in 2020 that we didn't do enough is we didn't talk to older people that had been there before. And I remember sitting with John Perkins and looking at his eyes and him saying, Albert, I looked at those white men as they beat me and I saw the hate in their eyes and I thought, I don't want that ever to consume me. That dark, it's so dark, I'll never come out. So it's not that love is passive, it's that love is ultimately the only way because hate will destroy you. So we had to embody an ethic of love and say, we're not gonna be driven by hate. And you can't meet force with force either. The Black Panthers, God bless them, they did great work in the neighborhoods and in communities. And I think overall they get a really bad rap, but a part of that ethic was meeting force with force and we are outforced. Read the history on them. FBI just started taking them out. 
We need a greater ethic. And that's the ethic of love. So we said we're going to choose love and not hate because hate is too dark. And prayer, yo, prayer is not passive. Yo, this was a big fight because people didn't want us to have prayer time, prayer meetings. They thought prayer was in it. Oh, prayer is our greatest weapon. Don't you ever, ever forget it. It's one of the biggest lessons we learned in 2020. Ain't none of this happening without prayer. Prayer is the thing that's going to get us through. Prayer is not passive. Prayer is to the pulling down of strongholds. It's our greatest weapon. More prayer, more power. Prayer is not passive. And trusting God is not inactive. Listen, now, our faith, we got a whole ethic that says we walk by faith, not talk by faith. So the very nature of our faith is active. We walk by faith. We, we, a, there, there, there are parts of the Bible that just unpack the reality that faith without works is actually dead. So the very essence of prayer and faith is active and work and productive. If you, if you, we would have lost big time in 2020 if we didn't hold on to prayer and lead by prayer. And if we would allow folks to talk us out of praying, talk us out of the power of prayer as if prayer and work is antithetical. No, prayer and work is come together. How do you think you're going to get the work done? It is through prayer. Prayer is not passive. So we had to establish that. That's how we had to do it. That's how we had to do it. We had to capture prayer. They called it a remnant because everybody didn't go with them. So there are some pastors that refuse to repent. There are some pastors that refuse to see it. There are still people that said it's not racism. Is that Those people will always be with you. But what happened to the people in 2020, they didn't focus on those folks. That's why it's a remnant. They grabbed those that could see it. They grabbed those that could hold on to something bigger. They grabbed on to that. And that's what drove them. That's what drove them. They learn to be silent and quiet and to listen and to love and they stopped reacting in the flesh and started responding in the spirit. One just yields greater results. So everybody gonna go and we ain't got the energy. Yo, back in 2020, we didn't have the energy to waste time on the people that wasn't going. We didn't have the energy to write blogs about the people that wasn't getting it. No, we had to grab those that were and say, come on, let's go. There was a remnant. But that remnant made impact. Now, here's, here's the final thing. And, and, and we've got to close on this because 2020, this is the big thing that they tackled that was impossible. Politics. It was when, I remember, we almost lost it. The remnant almost fell apart when it came to this because we were so party-driven and the parties were so cut down uh, socioeconomic or, or minority or racial lines. It was so hard. The idolatry and the demonic forces of political party were raging at an all-time high. We almost lost the coalition here. This is where it almost fell apart. But we finally realized we got to care about policy and not party. We've got to be driven by policy and not party because the parties divided us like never before. The churches were just divided. You can go around churches and mark one, this church red, this, per this church blue. This we were so divided, but we realized we really care about people. And But we thought that we could a la carte are what we cared about. So you had some folks that cared about abortion. You had some folks that cared about socioeconomically starved people or people that are that are that are suffering in poverty. As if we get to pick one or the other. It was crazy back then. I know you probably can't even imagine, but it was crazy. So you had people when they got into the argument, they say, "Yeah, but abortion, abortion. All these babies. I'm not going. to I'm not going to ever vote for anybody that's bound for murdering uh, babies." But then you got other folks being like, "Yo, adults are being murdered by police. You don't care about that." And it was almost as if I don't have enough time to care about both of them at the same time, or I'm not willing to do the hard work to figure out how we do something. And the politicians just played us because the government is a reflection of us. We didn't realize it. We didn't realize we were just getting played. So we, we were catering to parties instead of catering to policies. So some leaders got together and they said, what are the kingdom policies that we want to hold on to and that we want to hold a, a, 
candidates accountable to. And we started pursuing kingdom policies. So we didn't vote by party. We voted by policy, policies that were going to care for the poor, that were going to care for the unborn, that were going to care for the needy, that were going to care for women and equal rights. We're going to make sure that all folks, it, it was it was unbelievable. And it confused the heck out of politicians because they couldn't put us in boxes anymore. They had to put us in crosses. Said these believers are not driven by party, they're driven by party because we cared about people and not power. <whistles> this one was huge. This required the power of the Holy Spirit. We cared about people and not power. So we would ask questions of our politicians and we would vote and give accountability in our precincts, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. What are you what are you doing about black people and brutality? And guess what? These were white people asking these questions. And people in poor and impoverished neighborhoods were saying, what are we doing? What are we doing about abortion clinics and liquor stores on every corner in food deserts? We started asking questions about people not driven by power and it changed politics. People had to start serving the middle, the, the middle and we people couldn't run to the left. People couldn't run to the right. They had to run to the cross because the believers in the remnant of 2020 got together and said, we will call people to the cross, not to donkeys, not to elephants, but we will call them to the lamb. <sighs> Once they got a taste of their power and recognized that they were better together, that was it. Change began to happen. <sighs> Just got a call. There's a um, police brutality incident that happened across town. I know what you're thinking. I thought that would have ended by now. Oh, no. The defense is still on the field. We figured out how to beat them. So, the, so although it's still a fight against systemic injustice all these years later, it's a fight we can now win because we figured out the strategy. And the strategy is we're actually better together. It's kind of like that episode, I'll close with this. Uh, it's kind of like that episode in Independence Day, the one with Will Smith, the true Independence Day. Remember how the, the alien forces had come in and they had this ability to where, regardless of what they shot at them, they couldn't pierce their machine. They couldn't pierce their, 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 their planes. They couldn't pierce them, their battleships. They couldn't pierce them at all. But then they loaded a virus into their thing and all of their uh, immunity just dropped. They, all, their ability to fight and hold on, it dropped and all of a sudden you could pierce them. Once they figured out how to beat them, Y'all remember the president? He said, get on the horn with the rest of America, with the rest of the world, and tell them how to bring those sons of bitches down. They figured out how to beat them. The disciples of 2020, they got on the horn with all the leaders. And they said, the way we're gonna beat them is being better together. So they got on the horn. And they figured out how to bring those sons of bitches of injustice down. So here's to the disciples of 2020.